To say that Netflix's new extreme schoolyard gambling K-drama Squid Game has been received warmly by the internet at large would be putting it mildly compared to the ghost pepperly reality. People are going nuts for this show. Forget IGN, it's popping off on CNN and the Wall Street Journal. And as someone who loves battle royales of both the big dumb and slow smart varieties, I couldn't be more thrilled to see one slapping this loud in the public ear. A lot of students studios are about to try to ape Squid Game's success, a few will succeed, many more will fail miserably, and as a man whose job is mocking schlock, I win either way. Before that gets underway, though, I feel the need to clarify a common misconception I've seen circulating through the broader Squid Game discourse. Quincy Lagardia of Polygon said that Squid Game marks its own territory among Battle Royale-type stories with its especially savage premise. Gavia Baker-Whitelaw of The Daily Dot called it thrilling and original, and IGN's Brittany Vincent writes, It's one of the most unique things you'll watch this year, and maybe ever. I hate to be that guy. Who am I kidding? No, I don't. All of you are wrong. Squid Game is not the most unique show you'll see this year, or particularly unique at all. It is a good show, a great one, even, and you may very well have never seen anything like it, but I, as an enlightened watcher of anime, have. It's called Kaiji Ultimate Survivor, and there are live-action adaptations of it that borrow less from it than Squid Game does. That's not a knock against the K-drama. Great artists steal, after all, and while Squid Game may have lifted its premise and world-building, the answer to its central mystery, and most of its core themes from Kaiji, it absolutely makes each of those things its own. It refines, polishes, and even improves upon the brilliant premise of the anime-slash-manga that inspired it in many ways, even as it falls short in others. And in my eyes, Squid Game has independently earned its wild, internet-breaking success by finding a way to make that obscure, niche, psychological thriller that only weird nerds like me ever cared about marketable and palatable to general audiences without killing its soul. Years ago, I made a whole video bitching about Kakegurui's failure to live up to Kaiji, which was really unfair in retrospect, because Kakegurui clearly isn't trying to be Kaiji, it's trying to be Yu-Gi-Oh, and it succeeds brilliantly, but that's a topic for another day. My point is, I was so desperate for a new Kaiji-esque experience that it blinded me to what actually makes Kakegurui good. And I'd wager three whole centimeters that many of you are starting to feel a similar way about Squid Game now that it's over. That kaiji craving is a funny thing. When you first get to the end of a gamble through all the trickery and triumphs, it satisfies like nothing else you've ever binged before. You feel full, content, but that always fades, and it always leaves behind a gnawing, ever-ballooning hunger that nothing else can satisfy. Squid Game has already accelerated that process for many of you with its wet fart of a sequel hook ending, and Kaiji is the only thing that can save you from it now. Uh, quick disclaimer, Kaiji will probably not save you if you're watching this because you're about to play a real survival game and also bad at Google. No, what you need, preferably in discreetly smugglable powdered form, are some instant pro gamer skills. And today's sponsor, G Fuel Energy Formula, has a lot of vitamins, antioxidants, and caffeine in it, which is basically the same thing. It also comes in a wide array of delicious, sugar-free forms, like the new Strawberry Slushy, the Tetris Blast Flavor Collection, or, if you're feeling Halloween-y, they still got that sweet Vampire Dom Mommy Maiden Blood. Get yours at gfuel.com today, and don't forget to use the promo code BASEMENT at checkout for 30% off an order of any size. So, what exactly does Squid Game borrow from Kaiji, and how does it tweak that formula for greater success? To answer that, I will need to drop some spoilers, but they're the same spoilers for both shows, so if you've seen one, you're all good. Both Kaiji and Squid Game follow a broke, habitual, petty gambler who finds himself tens of thousands of dollars deep in debt and is approached by a seemingly friendly suit with an opportunity to clear it all at once and maybe even get rich. That opportunity takes the form of a simple, universally familiar game with a dark twist and sky-high stakes that ruin the lives of over half
half the people playing it. With a bit of friendly help, our hero is able to escape the game with his life, but not with any money, and after just a few days on the outside, he's already desperate enough to take another shot at an even deadlier competition. Though it's not just the games themselves that pose a threat. His fellow players, even the ones he trusts the most, are just as desperate as he is, and if it comes down to him or them, any one of them might betray him. Some are even planning ahead for it. Eventually, the horrifying true reason behind the hero and his fellow debtors' suffering is revealed when they're made to put on numbered pennies and race across a steel beam bridge, above a deadly drop, and in front of a jeering crowd of wealthy spectators. They're little more than human racehorses in a competition dreamed up by the childishly sadistic billionaire president of a dubiously legal mob-connected money-lending conglomerate who long ago grew bored with everything his money could buy, which was literally everything, and figured he could turn a tie profit by solving that boredom for himself and his fellow sociopathic socialites. And the injustice of it all ultimately incenses our hero to the point that, despite winning enough to get out safe and clean, he feels compelled to go back in and take the Game Masters down, even though it could very well cost him everything and more yet again. That's where Squid Game ends for now, whereas Kaiji's been running a lot longer since 96, so naturally there's a lot more of it left to go. And I I do think that this is where their paths will diverge, since many of the biggest narrative differences in Squid Game are sequel hooks. For example, there's the whole series-long B-plot about a cop infiltrating the game facility, which doesn't really accomplish much this season beyond providing a frame for behind-the-scenes exposition and setting up one of the dumbest and most predictable plot twists in history. A twist whose resolution is cut unceremoniously short when the K-pop cop gets shot in the shoulder and falls off a cliff leaving no body behind, so obviously he's gonna be back, and the next season's gonna be about that. Most likely he'll team up with Sung Gi-hun to stop the games while we follow a new cast of characters through a new set of them. On that note, the thematic nature of the games in each show is also obviously quite different. Kaiji, for the most part, takes part in modified games of chance. Mahjong, Rock, Paper, Scissors, CeeLo, Pachinko, that sort of thing. Whereas in Squid Game, which is named for a tag-like Korean playground game, all of the competitions are simple, self-explanatory schoolyard affairs, like red light, green light, or betting marbles. Except for that race across the steel beams, which only makes it even more obvious that the whole scenario was copy-pasted straight from Kaiji and infused with mild amounts of Eyes Wide Shut shit. This shift in focus does have some drawbacks for Squid Game. These simple, kid-friendly activities don't leave much room for the interpersonal drama, strategy, and mind games that make Kaiji's matches such nail-biters. The only game that gets anywhere near as cerebral and tense as Kaiji is the marble game, so if you enjoyed that episode and would like to see a whole series like it, now you know where to look. On the flip side, though, Squid Game's approach is infinitely more accessible. Restricted Rock, Paper, Scissors is cool because it takes a game that everyone knows and adds a few surprisingly deep wrinkles that completely change how you play it. Red Light, Green Light is cool because it takes a game everyone knows and adds exactly one bullet for anyone who loses. It takes a bit of time to really wrap your head around Kaiji's games, and even longer to truly appreciate the despair and dread of the labor camps that awaits the losers. The consequences for failure in Squid Game are simple, immediate, and loud. Any viewer can project themselves into Squid Game from just a single social media clip. It's almost impossible to watch the first game without thinking, well, if I were there, I would simply not move when the robot's looking at me. It's a similar marketing principle to those stupid fucking mobile game ads where you watch someone open an obviously wrong gate in a maze full of lava or something like that. The goal is not to make the game itself seem fun, but rather to make you think, I could do that, because then you're already thinking about playing it instead of about whether you'd even want to play it. Oh man, I sure do love this G Fuel that I got for 30% off using promo code BASEMENT at checkout, but it takes so long to stir, there has to be a better way. As soon as you learn how much money's on the line in Squid Game, and then Google how much that is in dollars, it's equally impossible not to ask yourself, 
would I go for it? Even if you're not trapped under a mountain of debt, a 1 in 456 shot at ultra high net worth individual status is pretty damn tempting, no matter how steep the consequences may be. And these games just make it look so darn easy. Until they don't, but by then, you're in too deep. I mean, it is just a show, so you can stop watching at any time, but you won't, because there's six episodes of Sunk Cost behind you already, and only three left to go. Adding to this upfront appeal is the vibrant, eye-catching aesthetic that permeates the games. The green tracksuits the players wear and the red coveralls of the masked soldiers are both instantly iconic. The huge, stark white room where they sleep and the candy-colored Escher painting that they have to climb to get to the games are memorably disorienting and otherworldly, and even if you've never seen a Korean schoolyard or back alley before, the warm, rustic game arenas instantly evoke a palpable sense of innocent nostalgia, which then clashes and contrasts beautifully with all the brutal violence contained within them. What I really appreciate about these social media-friendly visuals is how well they're justified within the narrative. Like, that Escher staircase is really weird, but it's also clearly designed to showcase the individual players to the audience and give them time to place their bets. The arenas are all built from the memories and dreams of the bored, nostalgic game master, like some sort of dark Disneyland. Even the ridiculously glitzy viewing box with the chaise lounges and snake body-painted titty pillow ladies makes sense as a hangout space for rich perverts. And these considerations all contribute a feeling of tangible believability to the setting. A feeling only slightly hampered by how obviously impossible it would be to dig underground tunnels that deep and build a retracting roof that huge on an island that small, especially while keeping it all secret. Kaiji, conversely, takes place much earlier in its whole survival game program, long before any sort of dedicated facility could be established, and is set mostly in easily isolated and repurposed locations, like a cruise ship or rooftop construction site. Tei does have plans for its own secret, fabulous underground island compound, but the slaves they recruited from the games are still working on digging that out, and it's probably never going to be finished because it's grossly impractical. In other words, it's easy to imagine the events of Kaiji taking place in our world, whereas Squid Game prioritizes making its world as cool and visually enticing as possible. There's value, I think, in both approaches, even if I personally prefer Kaiji's. Either way, what really matters, and thankfully what both series nail, is grounding the characters and making their individual circumstances and motivations compelling and believable. Because it's through their eyes that we witness the horror, and it's our attachment to them that gives it bite. Squid Game is an ensemble piece that spends a ton of screen time between each individual survival game, building relationships between and exploring the backstories of its many players. By the final few games, every face in the room is a familiar one, and thanks to great performances across the board from a talented cast that I am genuinely impressed the show was so willing to kill off, you understand what makes each of them tick. Not all of them are likable, but the ones who aren't are immensely entertaining at least, and they're all at least a little sympathetic. Except the gangster, he's just pathetic. For the most part, though, the show is really good at making you not want to see these people die when the games begin, even when you know that they inevitably will, because it's pretty obvious who the final pair is going to be. Kaiji, by contrast, and true to its title, tells its story more or less exclusively from its hero's perspective. He does come by some allies through his struggles, but most of them are temporary, and because paranoia is a big component of the tension, we rarely learn much about them until the games are underway. But once they are, once the initial fear subsides and Kaiji starts analyzing allies and enemies alike to gain an advantage, the layers of hidden psychological metagaming created by their deceptively complicated rules provide ample space and tools for exploring those characters in depth. This approach does mean the villains tend to be better fleshed out than the expendable supporting cast, but that doesn't undermine the tension of the games because we're always made to care about Kaiji's fate, and with most of his gambles having sub life or death stakes, the possibility that he'll lose badly almost always looms large. 
And we do at least come to understand what kind of people his friends are, and more importantly, how they got in this mess in the first place. Because that horror I mentioned isn't really about the sensationalized violence on screen. That is shocking in the moment, sure, and the non-violence Songwu commits against Ali is even worse, but what's really terrifying, what really eats at you long after the show's done, is the thought that all of this carnage is actually a pleasant alternative, an escapist fantasy, compared to the very real horror that awaits all of these characters outside. We're not really conditioned to think of debt as being all that bad. In fact, we're generally encouraged by society at large and credit card ads specifically to take at least some debt on throughout our lives. It is deceptively easy for that to snowball, though, and once what you owe exceeds a certain threshold, when the interest is higher than what you can pay back each month, you're in real trouble. Saving money and building toward the future becomes less and less feasible, and if something goes wrong in the present, you get laid off or just get sick for a while, the trap can close completely. In the deepest depths of debt, your property, your labor, your future, and even your body can cease to be your own. If you have skills that the rich find useful, possibly paid for with a massive inescapable student loan, you may be able to rent a decently comfortable life while helping one of them get even richer forever, but if not, you may find yourself beaten within an inch of your life for pocket change, forced into prostitution or slave labor, possibly in an American prison, or you could even, depending on where you live, lose a body part or two to cover the difference. These desperate situations are exactly what drive people into cults, MLMs, and the NFT market. And, of course, more traditional gambling avenues also profit mightily from the terminally indebted. Hope, no matter how statistically slim, is always an easy sell to folks who have none of it. And that kind of desperate, visibly irrational decision-making, which any one of us might fall prey to in similar circumstances, makes it just as easy to judge those people as deserving of their fates from afar. Just Listen to any news story about the homeless. That's what makes the premise of Kaiji, and by extension Squid Game, feel so disturbingly plausible. Life or death matches of rock, paper, scissors, and red light, green light for big cash prizes sound on their faces absurd. The logistics of running them kinda are when you think about it. But also, when you think about it, they're not really that far removed from the mechanisms that already exist to prey on the poor. They just kill them a little faster. And the way the game runners and patrons talk about the players is virtually identical to the dehumanizing rhetoric used to justify that perpetual exploitation. Exploitation. That's why the big twist of Squid Game, the true identity of the Game Master, kinda irks me. I get why they did it. Hyodo, the equivalent character in Kaiji, kinda feels like he comes out of left field when he shows up and doesn't get many chances to interact with our hero, so making him someone we already know does increase the sense of drama around him. But Hyodo is so terrifying precisely because he's so distant, so detached from his humanity and humanity at large by his wealth and power, that he'll use that power to hurt people for fun without a second thought. Letting us, and especially letting the hero, get to know him would only diminish his menace. It has exactly that effect on Squid Game's finale, and it also has the side effect of making the show's best episode less interesting and emotionally impactful on second viewing, which is pretty much the opposite of what a good twist should do. That said, the rich Americans, who speak in very convincing, not at all hilariously awkward English, do fill the Hyodo-shaped void in their own despicably terrifying way, as frivolous hedonists who view the players as toys that they're all too eager to watch break. We, on the other hand, get to know the players so intimately that we simply can't see them that way. Sure, some of them, like Doc Su and Song Wu, got here solely on account of their own stupid, greedy choices, but most have been victimized by people like those guys, exploited by their employers, conned out of money, or both. They're not all great people, we see most of them making bad decisions that hurt others, but bad decisions are more understandable coming from people with no good options. 
Kaiji and Song Gi Hun both seem like real shit heels when we first meet them, blowing off steam by slashing tires and stealing horse race money from mom, respectively. But Kaiji is really just a naive kid done dirty by Japan's lost decade, an era when opportunities for kids were thin on the ground. And as we learn more about Gi Hun, we come to realize that he used to be a pretty stand up guy before the world beat that out of him by making him watch a cop beat his co worker to death to break their strike. A strike that, in retrospect, only served to hurt his future employment prospects and destroy his marriage. But at the time, it really seemed like the righteous, good thing to do, and he was the kind of dude to do that thing. While the philosophy of true equality behind Squid Game is quite clearly less of a high-minded ideal than it is a guarantee of statistical fairness to the rich monsters betting on it, it does create an environment where the old Sung Gi Hun can re-emerge and even thrive. Quick wits and outside-the-box thinking get him through each game, while his kindness and pronounced sense of justice act like a beacon in the darkness, drawing invaluable allies into his ragtag group, even as the apparently stronger gang led by Duck Su slowly eats itself alive. And that's one of the best and weirdest things about survival game stories. They are, by and large, nihilistic carnivals of darkness and depravity, which can be fascinating enough on its own, but that darkness can also serve to highlight, by contrast, humanity's brightest features. Even if it's just a single candle flickering in an ocean of shadow, that element is ever-present in both Kaiji and Squid Game. Both make a big, convincing show of blowing it out, too. And it's through watching that flame persevere, burn brighter in the face of adversity, that both series deliver their most satisfying moments of triumph. Watching someone beat the same sort of odds that beat most of us down day after day is a rare thrill, and at the end of the day, it doesn't really matter which one did it first, Kaiji, or better, also Kaiji though. I just feel lucky to have found that feeling more than once. I'm Jeff Thu, professional Kaiji fan, signing out from Watch Kaiji, goddammit!